Good morning everyone, welcome back to the channel. Um, today we are clearing up the workshop, getting ready for the next series. Um, I've decided what I'm gonna do is I'm going to do the Motogazi first before I finish the Norton. Uh, so sorry to the Norton fans who are waiting for that fastback to come out, but um, that's just gonna have to wait until I do the Guzzi first. So, um, this place needs to be sorted out. It's a total mess in here. I really don't like working like this. But I think with the two VFRs, it was a, it was a nightmare for space and um, the time I have with my, my day job. So I think before we start anything, we get this place totally cleaned out. We can then start to think clearly about all the challenges that the Guzzi is going to give me. Uh, and that we can get it out in a reasonable time for the client and that they'll be happy with the finish. So uh, I'll see you uh, when we've got the guzzy on the workbench. This is the, the Le Mans Mark I. For all of those who don't know what a motor guzzy is, it's one of the early cafe races, Italian cafe races. It's missing a front cowl, a small one with a single light. And these exhaust pipes are not original. Um, we're going to have to look at that. So with this project, the first thing I do is I'm going to look at it. I'm going to stare at it from all the sides. I haven't had a proper look at it because I've been quite obsessed by the Ducati, to be fair. So now I'm going to focus solely on this, do as much reading as I can. So uh, guys on the forum, please um, throw in comments, advice, anything you want. It's going to help me get uh, dialed into this bike so that I can do it 100% correct, which is what the customer was hoping for. So um, hopefully you enjoy the series with me as I take you through the trials and tribulations of what this motorcycle is hiding underneath the hood. Hello Maya. That's not as bad as I thought actually. I mean it's got a big tear from what I can see down in the middle. So I'm gonna see if I can't restore this. Uh, it's gotta get rid of all this glue. You can see that's gone there. And that side has come back. But I've got some techniques that I'm gonna to apply to this and see if we can save it. Here's the first challenge. Just amazing stuff on this is um, WD-40 um, specialist fast release penetrant. You especially like to use this um, when I'm trying to get rid of things exactly like this. This problem now I would have probably snapped off at least another two or three. Yeah, I'd like to try and save it if I can. Twelve six one. So that. Um it's not bad, considering it haven't charged, so I'm gonna put on trickle charge and then just see how long it holds that charge for. It's gonna take a lot of rubbing. Huh. Okay, well, we might have a solution. If you ever want to listen to a great uh, album by John McLaughlin, one that isn't very, very well known, is Thieves and Poets. Oh my goodness, it's just, it's, just, it's a masterpiece. Beautiful music. I called Jan Moretz orchestrating. Just check it out. I usually uh, like to start somewhere that is 
maybe not as important as the main uh, tasks on the bike. Um, I don't know, it just gives me time to think about what I'm getting involved in. Um, gives me time to think through things, get a sense of how much work there is to do. Just instead of going in hammer and tongs on the on the uh, engine and stripping the whole bike down, it gives just, just time to settle and uh, feel my way around really. Super glue and rubber are very, very compatible. Um, foam rubber, not so sure. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to drop some in. See how you want really some very fluid super glue. Um, don't be scared to put it on. Let's get it all in there. And then bind it, bond it. work through Wrong. Let's see how that goes in the meantime this is coming off yeah I might well have been right that is really quite strong but I'm gonna use alcohol for now and if I see any signs of yep it's definitely fading can't do that sometimes won't affect um, because that was better with the glue if not I'm gonna to have to painstakingly remove this or photograph this and then wipe it off and then apply the, the, the graphic back on again but I want to get the exact decal correct exactly so it was hot wired uh, so I've just reconnected everything. The reason why it wouldn't uh, spark was because the earth was not absolutely hammered down tight. We're sitting at just over a hundred um, on that cylinder. Yeah, so that one is a hundred, and this one's under I mean it's leaking off but it was just under it's about 85 okay rear mud guard ready to be stripped and cleaned and checked for any damage luckily this is a uh, fiberglass which is so much better than plastic for repairs, for obvious reasons. Plastic is a little fiddlier, and it's also quite thick and nice and solid, I must say. Very excited to be doing this project. So let me show you this. Um, you can see we've got to figure out, the trick in this is to figure out what was actually here before. This has been uh, just adapted to make it fit somehow. We'll get there. So here I am in uh, sunny Paris on a week break, and I've got a chance um, to sit out in the garden and actually look at this uh, motor guzzi properly and do some research on the um, on the layout the aesthetics and there seems to be quite a lot of variants out there for the mark one this is now the transition or pre-transition 1977 the round tail light version so i've got to get this right things like the the, the black top of the tank is it matte or is it gloss so there's a lot to um to try and analyze see what was the correct colors and what were the correct finishes on these bikes so um, yeah there's quite a lot of research going down but I'm really glad to finally get to it now how to take fuel out of a motorcycle just pump straight out 
nice and cheap really is good value for money that's quite good Jammed. Okay, so far it's coming apart really well. Uh, I've just taken off one of the shocks. What you'll notice is if you're a Guzzi fan, that the Mark I had a all metal, non-black shock absorber. This one is black. I think it's been painted. I'm hoping it's been painted. It looks like it's flaking off. It could be. I don't think it, yeah. We're gonna, I'm just going to put it into the sandblaster and take this off and just see what I've got underneath before I go any further. Um, this is kind of the way I like to do things, is do it slowly, um, do tests on things, check, um, because I'd hate to do any destructive damage to this fork as it is. So we're gonna put it with this uh, particular aggregate we've got, which is very light, it only takes paint off, so we won't get a sandblasted aluminum finish. So I'll show you when that's done. There you have it. There would have been this aluminium finish. So this restoration really begins now. And, uh, it's nice. Right, let's go and sandblast this. This shouldn't be black. It should be natural. There we go. Okay, first problem. This was snapped off. Let's go and clean this one up. So all the parts that I sandblasted had some gold on them. I'm not sure what the significance of that is. I'll have to go and look it up and see. It's a paint gold. I'm, I'm of the opinion that it's probably um, been sprayed on afterwards. The least. Yeah, 
it does astound me uh, that sometimes there's budgets that are so incredibly high for restoration jobs where it's unnecessary in many, many cases. Now, it really does depend on what the client wants. If they want a 100% perfect concourse bike, then of course they would know that money is no object and uh, they have to fork out for all the replacement parts on these on these bikes there. And, and plus they're old, so the parts are gonna be hard to come by. That's labor, that's time, that's all that stuff. I feel that in some cases, the client should be given the option to um, decide whether they want something restored, which might not be 100% perfect, or uh, whether it needs to be replaced. Now, of course, I'm not going to put back onto the motorcycle something that is clearly uh, damaged or got a crack mark in it or just just spoils the look of the finished bike. As you've seen some of my other projects, I'm fairly pedantic about that. And some I'm not. The VFRs that I did, I just don't think they're worth stripping down to nuts and bolts and re-zinking and plating. They're just not. Um, but they really look nice now and they ride well and that's what it matters. With this one, uh, we have a very, very tight budget, which is a real test because I have to try and fix everything. Here's what I'm talking about. I think there's some restoration channels where, because that looks that way, this will just be replaced. And I think that's silly. We're gonna clean that up. We're gonna seal it, unless it's structurally not sound. And we're gonna paint it and we'll protect it. Um, another saving. For, for very good reason. There's a dent in there. We're going to knock that out. We'll straighten that up. It'll be as good as new when we're finished. So you can see there's a milkiness to them. Especially that one. It's milky. Um, so I have to get this cap off. Is that a bit of a bump here? Um... So you can see me restoring a smith dial is pretty challenging uh, and so you, if you go into the Norton uh, playlist you'll see the smith dials being restored there so it's going to be very interesting to see what the Italians do with their um, chronometers so we've got to be super super careful great that's in good nick very good condition really trying so hard not to damage the rim too much yeah that's come out really well I hope I can just seam that back again so here's uh, going to be a nice challenge you can see this has been really weather beaten see how I can get that chrome back on again I'll ponder on that one for a few days.